I've got. You are not sure that you will understand. Oh, where I put it? Big special device, and uh, it will have a translation, online translation, where you have very, very good translator. Good. So, <laughs> I would like to introduce you, Professor Harry Runder, from the University of Toronto. He is the director of the Center of uh, Nanotechnology yeah. and Material Science. Yes, I yes. <laughs> yes you Thank you. <laughs> and um, the lecture will be devoted to different kinds of senses. Really, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Nor does he. <laughs> so, welcome. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure. <laughs> Whoops. Yikes, never mind. <laughs> it's, a, it's a pleasure to have a chance to uh, talk to you today. Um, you know, as, as you heard, I'm from the University of Toronto and uh, sort of very similar climate to here, which is kind of nice, so no changes. Um, what I'm going to do is, we talked a few times, but I decided to do something different. I've collected together uh, a bunch of work we've done in the area of sensing and three different types of sensing, as you'll see, physical, radiation, and biochemical. I'm not sure within the time limits how far I'm going to get through all of these, but this is over the years we've worked in all these different platforms and these are sort of a summary, little snippets, that can be more like case studies of the kind of things you can expect. So but I'll begin just by kind of telling you what enables all this research, and that is the fact that in my centre uh, and group we have a lot uh, advanced uh, growth, process, growth and processing uh, facilities. So in particular, I'll be focusing on semiconductor nanostructures. Um, and they'll, these structures mean that you, know, you're, you have monolayer control over the deposition process. And uh, MBE is one of the techniques which we use a lot, which stands for molecular beam epitaxy. And um, you can actually control the growth thickness to submonolayer. So with in-situ techniques and characterization, you can, such as read, um, you can actually tell where the atoms are sitting and how many are coming in and so forth. And if you then combine that with the yellow block on here, I'm afraid I, I should have a look for a pointer, but oh, here's a pointer. All right, I'm going to come from behind here. It's nice not to hide behind there. All right, so let me see if I can figure this thing out. Pointer. Is it a pointer, pointer, pointer? Nope, that's not a pointer. <laughs> that's not a pointer. Okay, this is a pointer. Yes. All right, 50-50, right? Okay, the other 50 is on here. Good. So, um, this is the left-hand side was what I meant, was I describing as growth. This piece in the middle, we have clean room facilities, which go down to class 10, actually. It says 100, but it's good down to class 10, which means extremely clean. And within those, we can do both traditional lithographies, which means carving up structures on the scale of hundreds of nanometers, as well as... Uh, carving things up using electron beam lithography, which is this system here. And with that, you can build nanostructures from the planar case. You can define structures which are of the order of a few nanometers. Right? So we can actually uh, really look at individual uh, clusters of atoms, if you like, defined by these processes. In conjunction also with these, there's all sorts of processing, like dry processing, which means that you pattern something and then you can dig down and you can create three-dimensional nanostructures too from the same approach. With that, we have characterization facilities. So just like in normal material science, you know, you think about growth property characterization. So we can also look at these, these complex nanostructures with the techniques such as ultra-fast optical spectroscopy. That means you pump light into the structure and all the energetic structure, all the electronic structures, energy level structures, um, from the high energy uh, radiation light, uh, as it decays down through the states, gives you back uh, radiation, which we can look at in time and we can look at in wavelengths, giving us both the energetic spectra and the dynamics of the movement of the energy in this particular case as it dissipates through the system. Um, and there's obviously standard techniques. The same thing goes for electrical characterization. And the reason I'm telling you this now is because in the talk um, on the sensing, the way you actually build sensors and design sensors, the way I'm going to describe it, is based on the feedback of this information. So that's why I'm giving a little bit of a, uh, an intro. Um, there's also, for example, a Kelvinox dilution fridge means you can get a very, very low temperatures where you can eliminate effects such as phonons, vibrations of the lattice, and so forth. 
and you can do magnetic transport to actually understand what it is that limits for a given structure the performance and then design a better structure. So that's why I kind of had this slide here. All right, I'm going to try my luck. Haha, <laughs> it worked nicely. All right, so the next slide here is just giving you some examples of those nanostructures um, that can be formed by such techniques. On the left, this is a schematic of a molecular beam epitaxy system. And some of the things we look at are things like nanowires, which are structures which have very, very high aspect ratio. Uh, so this may be microns long, tens of microns in length, and a few nanometers in diameter. And these are perfectly single crystal uh, materials that we kind of look at for various things. And in the biochemical, I'll talk a little bit about building transistors from these kind of materials. On the right, you see the same MBE systems, except we're now layer by layer growing in little apertures, which are defined by, by these pores here. Um, and you can grow, for example, in the Marsnard or other materials that I'll talk about, you can create arrays of dots uh, that can be used for dense, same size um, entities, where the energetic structure of every entity is the same because it's defined by its size. Okay, so that was a bit of a kind of intro into that. Um, in my research group, we have um, about 25 uh, researchers, about 10 graduate students, 13 postdocs and research associates, technician and administration and so forth, and we're funded by lots of people. And I'll talk about some of the projects which involve companies like Cisco, uh, Nortel, OptoMem, MicroMem, and all these kind of companies, large companies. We do General Electric, actually, I'll talk about some of that work too. So, and we're always looking for good students and so forth, so <laughs> anyone want to contact me, great, I'll say hello. All right, so I'm going to start with, and, and the way this talk is set up, just to make it easy so you know where we are, um, the sensors, I've, I, the color will refer to the top of the slide and the header banner. You'll see a red banner. That's going to mean, sorry, yeah. Can I ask you to yes. speak slower? Slower. I certainly can. Okay. I always do my slow talk. This is my very slow. <laughs> okay. I'll do soon. That was slow. That was slow. You should see the fast. <laughs> All right. So I'll speak very slowly. Um, so, uh, color coding. The sensors that are based on physical things, such as looking at position, motion, um, or actually, you know, definition, the topology, of, if you like, of an, of an object, um, I'll call physical, it'll be red. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about radiation sensing, this optically stimulated luminescence dosimeter. Uh, and then that'll be in blue, and then you'll see the last section, all on biochemical sensing, will be in green. All right, so let me get into the first topic, first area. I'm going to try and speak slowly, <laughs> but you're going to have to kick me. Um, we'll be on uh, the two-dimensional, so this is going to be position and motion sensing. Red, right? And the nanostructure idea here is something that I worked on many, many years ago. We're actually one of the first groups in the world to come up with these type of structures when I was actually a student at MIT. And so the idea is to harness something called a two-dimensional two -dimensional electron gas. And the structure shown on the left here, and I'm going to talk in detail about that. Um, and the reason why we look at this structure for these particular sensors is because this two-dimensional electron gas is imbued with um, extremely high carrier mobilities. That's the carrier mobility, and the numbers here refer to, for example, the record here I'm just showing for 1989, for example, a group we work with actually in, in um, Cambridge, uh, is around 10 million, in fact now it's almost 20 million centimeters squared per volt second. So that means meaning of mobility, just for those that are not in that space, is if I apply an electric field, it's the velocity of an electron per unit electric field applied how fast it moves effectively for a given push. Okay? So the, the faster it moves, it turns out what we're going to use it for is if I have a magnet, it turns out that this, uh, this layer can be used to sense the magnet above it. And the ability to sense will depend on this parameter here. Right? So the, the purpose of this exercise is to harness high mobility, which comes from these structures, to make sensors uh, that look at the position of a magnetic layer. Okay, so let me talk in detail now about this thing. So the two-dimensional electron gas structure is traditionally, has traditionally been formed, and this is some of the stuff we did from many, many years ago, um, is formed at the heter interface, the interface between two different materials, heter interface, the two different materials being aluminum gallium arsenide and gallium arsenide, two semiconductors. They're chosen. Why are they chosen in this structure? Because 
one of the things that defines a perfect interface is lattice mismatch. When the atoms on one material and the atoms on the other align, the lattice constants actually, um, the strain at the interface is minimal, actually it's basically zero here. So the tendency to, for things, defects to form, particularly dislocations, which will hold charge for non radiative recombination centers, is negligible. So in principle, and it, the same thing is true, by the way, for silicon, silicon dioxide, uh, a thermal oxide on silicon. Uh, that's the reason why, essentially, electronics today work so well, even though people are trying to now improve in different ways. So, how does this thing work? It works that if I dope, which means I put in a foreign impurity, which is not a block state of the crystal, into, into this side, this aluminium gallium arsenide material, a fraction of these donors are ionized at room temperature, which means they give their electrons off, and these electrons see a barrier here. This is the energy structure, increasing energy up here. And they have a barrier, but they can overcome this barrier. So those electrons get taken from this side of the structure to here. And as, they, as these impurities, these donors as they're called, because they donate the electron, as they transfer their electron, they leave behind, because they're neutral to start with, they leave behind a net positive charge. So the image of the charge that's over here result in a bending of the bands by Poisson's relationship. So back to simple <coughs> electrostatics, if you go back to, to that. So the larger the amount of charge that's moved, the higher the electric field here. And the electric field can be looked at by the gradient of this band. Right? So the more I move across, the higher this band. And those electrons get squeezed in closer and closer to that dark line here, the interface. Right? So I end up with electrons confined within a distance called the de Broglie wavelength. And if they're in that, if the half wavelength of electrons is in the scale of this size here, then we'll have quantized states. First quantized state, second quantized state, right? And hence it's called a quantum well. It happens to have a shape which is triangular, so the solutions to Schrodinger's equation become airy function solutions, right? So they're sort of like lopsided wave functions. So why does this thing give me high mobility? And you might want to interrupt me. I'm happy to kind of explain if you're not sure about a comment as we go. I'll give you the answer. So it's simple. The reason is that we don't dope to the interface. Because if you think about a bulk material, what makes a nanostructure here and what makes it a bulk material? So what, apart from the quantization, what's important is in a bulk material, in order for me to get the carriers that sit in this thing, these black carriers, I have to ionize the donors. But the carriers only move so far from the donors. So the donors, which are charges, are a background to the carriers around them. So the scattering efficiency by a Coulomb center, which is what it is, is very, very high. So the mobility is low. Here, if I dope, and this is what this diagram is showing, if I dope with the silicon dopant, which is what we're talking about here in this gallium arsenide, very high, and then I leave a gap, a margin, and this is called, this margin is of the length D from the header interface, then I still get a decent amount of tunneling from the carriers which are over here, jumping in here, but the Coulomb tail of the wave function, which extends into this alloy region here, is very weak. So the scattering rate is very low because the impurities which scatter are now far away. We call them remote scattering impurities. So therefore the mobility is high. So if I look, this is from that paper I told you about those papers many, many years ago. We looked at, this is a theoretical paper we did, so we looked at the effect of mobility of various things. The background impurities, if I have any extraneous impurities, things that I don't want there, they're extremely effective in lowering the mobility. So if I can lower the background and at the same time use the remote impurities to transfer carriers and get me this gas density, then I can get extremely high mobilities. And if you look at it the, at low temperatures or even moderate temperatures, you really just want to be phonon scattering limited, not deformation potential acoustic phonons, but piezoelectric phonons. And that's exactly what you get when you understand how wide, this is 200 nanometers, to make that separating region and how to dope. Once you do that, you can get your hands on the ultra high mobilities we're talking about here. And I don't know what happened here with the slide, but I apologize. All right, so purpose of the slide to show you the bulk. This is the bulk mo mobilities over here. This is the carrier dense in the bulk, and I'm afraid everything got smooshed together. And here's the same thing for the 2D structure. If we, if we think about, and the purpose of this slide is as follows. 
It's to show you that if I do an experiment, which is a classical experiment, which began the revolution in semiconductors, actually it was done in metallic structures, but effectively this was the experiment which enabled people to understand how to build uh, transistors and everything. And it's called the Hall Effect Experiment, which I'm sure all of you know about. Basic idea is that you apply a longitudinal field to, uh, which is effectively the current, if you like, a small potential difference, driving current through the structure. And if you have effectively Lorentz force on the thing, which means you've got the combination of the electric and the magnetic fields, you will deflect your the, uh, holes, the positive charge is going to move this way, and your electrons will move this way, and you'll separate them and create a built-in voltage, which is called the Hall effect. And the Hall effect, um, its voltage, which is the separating, the separation, this lateral transverse separation of charge, creates an electric field, or we can just express it as the voltage, which is proportional to the magnetic field, given the geometry and everything else of the system. So for us, we want to build a sensor, and we want the sensor to be sensitive to magnetic field. So you can see, if I go through the analysis, which I'm afraid is all covered up behind here, and I do apologize, I don't know what happened here, the rate of change of the whole voltage with respect to the magnetic field applied is directly proportional, and it's proportional to the longitudinal conductivity. And the longitudinal conductivity, of course, is, is proportional to the product of the carrier density, the 2D gas density, and its mobility. So a higher mobility and a high density gives you, of course, a very high sensitivity, which is what we want. Okay? So if I look at, unfortunately, it's off these figures, but you can translate in rough terms, if I think the electron gas density, if you went back here in Galley Mars night, is around the order of 10 to the 12, which means uh, 10 to the 12 per centimeter cube, which is like 10 to the 6 per unit length, or 10 to the 18 per cubic centimeter in equivalent. So we can go back here, and you could read off what the mobility in bulk Galley Mars night, because it's a Galley Mars night. It's in either you can think about it as three-dimensional galley mass night or two-dimensional. They're both galley mass night. And in the bulk, we would have 10 to the 18 carriers. You read the mobility and you find the mobility would be around 1,200 centimeters squared per volt second, same units. 180,000 would be what you'd expect for the two-dimensional electron gas, which means that the sigma x, the constant in here, is going to be around 150 times larger in the two-dimensional gas, which means you're going to have the basis of a very good sensor if you engineer structures like this. Okay, so how do we do it? This is the principle of what we try to do, and then I'll show you the practice. So we, what we basically did is we built a microsystem. So here's the two-dimensional electron gas structure, and you have a separating, separating kind of structure, and above it, you juxtapose the um, a silicon membrane structure, ultra-thin, that can move, on which is, again, disposed magnetic layer. And I'll talk about what it is in particular, but the main idea, as you'll see, maybe I'll just kind of go straight to the next slide, is that the deflection or movement of the magnetic layer with respect to the two-dimensional electron gas is changing the penetrating flux, magnetic flux, which is the B, if you like, the BZ in the previous slides. So, you know, the change in B is going to give you a change in the whole voltage. And so all we need to do is not have a two-dimensional gas, but have a two-dimensional electron gas sensor, which means Hall effect sensor, down there, and we'll be able to sense what's going on, as in this deflection delta will show up as a VH, or V Hall. Okay? So the first thing we did, we built these two-dimensional electron gas Hall effect sensors, and there's a whole nonsense to what sort of geometry you should have, how you should uh, look at the stray fields and so forth, but I think basic idea is this is the Hall sensor, and we expect uh, for applied magnetic field, which we look at, the change in whole voltage. And here it is, change in whole voltage is the points for this sensor, right? So is that reasonable? You can go back to a Hall equation. This is the sensitivity in terms of the whole voltage per unit of magnetic field. Here are all the parameters which gave us the conductivity. And indeed, that's exactly the conductivity we'd expect. I just showed it to you in the previous slide. Um, actually, 158 is the number, but close enough, 163. So everything is consistent with the extremely high mobilities that I just spoke about earlier and the electron gas density. So that's reasonable. So the next thing is you want to build the magnetic structure above it. So what did we do? We had the silicon membrane, and we uh, did electroplating um, on these kind of copper pads here. We did electroplating of uh, nickel, 
to form these things, and then we use a loop around here. And the idea is that the, a current passing through a loop will create a magnetic field which can help us to magnetize these little fellas here. And then we have the magnetized elements. We know what the saturation magnetization, we know what we're kind of at, and we can move this thing and we have our sensor system. So here's the result, because I don't want to kind of go on endlessly. We're going to do a few case studies like this before you all fall to sleep. Um, so here is first the static testing, which is how does the whole voltage depend on, that's the delta. It says D, but it's the delta in my previous diagram. And indeed, we've got a nice dependence here. And you can actually show that we could, um, we can measure down the changes down to basically uh, angstrom level changes, so extremely high, all because of that sensitivity. And here is a dynamic response, and, we, and the company actually that started as kind of looking at this space was a company in exploration, oil and gas. And they have things called geophones, which are essentially what this is, um, which are these big masses on a spring, and they effectively look at the movement of the mass. Uh, and they get their sensing. And we could reproduce by orders of magnitude what they had. But what we could do too, which I'll just kind of finish up with, is because with microsystems, you can build something of one size, which is effectively one mass, or you can change the frequency response by changing the size or mass. We could spectrally decompose a complex, uh, a complex structure, acoustic structure, coming back at the geophone. So, well, it's not a geo, at our, whatever you want to call it, members phone. Um, to decompose it into all the components around. So the, the beauty of this is not just sensitivity, but it's also flexibility, and that's the truth. In any microsystem design, you have access to a much higher level of information and also integration of information, as well as performance. And that was kind of an example. Okay, so still in the red space, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the idea of sensing, but sensing for visible sensing, cameras effectively. And I'll start with, and again, the idea is that we'd like to have something which does a little bit better and something a little bit different to what's out there right now. So what we're doing in this case is trying to actually sense, uh, a, have a balanced camera, something that is a camera that can either look like your eye would look at a scene. That means the, there's a photopic and a scotopic response of the eye. You know, everyone sort of has a peak at 550 nanometers or so, you know, and there's a roll-off, so the sensitivity is maximum for the green, but rolls off either side. So if you want to imitate how the eye would see something as a kind of camera system, then you'd like to be to balance, to have equal responsivity or responsivity in proportion to the photopic response. Or, for example, you could look at machine vision that wants to have a bias in a certain way, and there's many applications, so it's one idea. The second thing is polarization response. Um, there's many applications where one wants to actually be able to polarization resolve an image, the light in an image. So those two things were things we were trying to look at. What we, what we started for, the nanostructure idea, is conveyed in this table here. That is that if you go with nanostructures like nanowires, and I kind of showed them um, for uh, Indy Mars night actually in the opening slide on molecular beam epitaxy, those type nanostructures are very interesting. They have a lot of surface area which usually you might say, well, that's interesting. In electronics, those surfaces create surface states which hold carriers, which are very good places for recombination. Well, actually, that's very nice for a photodetector, like a photodiode. Actually, let's say for a photoconductor for a minute here. Um, why? Because they tr will selectively trap one carrier. So the other carrier can keep cycling around your detector. So the gain, which is essentially a measure of how many times a carrier moves around and therefore how big your signal is going to be, will be very large. And if I look at a nanowire photoconductor, they can reach as much as 10 to the 10. So you have an inherently sensitive object, even though it's very small. So the volume, remember, absorption of light will go with volume. So if I have an object with very small volume, however good it is, it's a problem. But if it's very good, it can compensate. So that's one issue. The other idea is, the other problem of a nanowire which is going to turn out to be interesting for us, is that if you have a very small nanowire, the wavelength of light, let's say we're talking about visible light, 500 nanometers, talk about the green stuff, right? But these nanostructures can be very small, and I'm going to be talking about five nanometer objects, diameter. So how does the light mode sit with respect to the wire? Well, obviously, it's far bigger than the nanowire. So the light mode is le leaks out 
it leaks out by 100 times the size of the, the mode, right? So you don't have very good coupling of the light to the wire. So I, what I'm going to talk about is taking advantage of that. So if I have a series of nanowires, I can actually, like antenna, couple the light from wire to wire to wire and use the lateral propagation of that energy to actually build a very interesting sensor. OK, so the first thing is just a little bit on principles. So <laughs> probably driving you crazy by now. All right, so the first thing is, you know, even we're, we're going to be talking about PIN. I'll talk about why that is in a minute. But they're small nanowires, 5 nanometers, I kind of mentioned earlier, roughly, a little bit bigger, some of them. But the wavelength of light, we said, is 500. So we're a hundredth of the R, the, the size of the wire to the wavelength of the light, is typically in this kind of range here, this green range, called the Raleigh range. Right? So we're in Raleigh scattering, and you can see that in that range, um, we have a, we're, we're dominated by linear Raleigh scattering, which is going to really help us, and I'll kind of come back to that a little bit. All right, so, oh, this is horrible. <laughs> I don't know what happened with the projection. <laughs> I'm very sorry. Don't look sorry, but I'm very sorry. Not bad, right? Not bad. <laughs> you should see good. All right, so um, what you see on this slide is the first, there are a few principles I want you to understand. So the parallel component of light coming in to the nanowire is this continuity, right? So basically no change in the electric field intensity. But if we look at the perpendicular component, which is going to be perpendicular to this interface here, then we have a very, very strong suppression because of the dielectric mismatch between the mode and the dielectric, well, mode in air, which has got a dielectric constant one, one uh, refractive index of one, and the high refractive index or dielectric constant, how you want to do it, of the medium here. And the suppression is in proportion to, this should be ER, which is the dielectric constant of the gray stuff, right? So the bigger is this, the larger that ratio. If this is one, right, I've got one plus something which is around 11 here, we'll call it 12, so a twelfth, right? So big suppression in the electric field, but more importantly, absorption goes with the wave vector, right? So the ratio of the perpendicular to the parallel is going to go with the square of that suppression, 100 times, right? So there's your anisotropy that I was talking about, perfect way to get the anisotropy. And the photocurrent that you see, or responsivity, is normally how it's measured, um, which is essentially the, the uh, output uh, voltage or current, actually, in the device per unit uh, intensity of light, will we'll have components which will be resolved into, by theta, the angle of the mode to the structure, which will be resolved into these two components. And you'll see, obviously, in, in proportion here. So, let me talk about how we make these things. So we wanted to make, and we made, these arrays of nanowires, which basically uh, are defined, uh, are done on a um, silicon on insulator process. Right? So basically, these wires become floating because it's silicon dioxide. The insulator um, is a perfect insulator, as far as we're concerned. And the silicon layer above is the thing we pattern to form these nanowires. And then we do implants to implant one side P-type, Middle side, under, back side, doped, P type, and MP. And you end up with arrays of wires which basically have these contacts where we can create this uh, electric field, internal electric field, depletion region, in which photocarriers, light which comes in, creates the carriers, and they're strongly separated by the built in electric field within the wire. Here's a picture of these wires, and you can see them lining up nicely between our contact pads. And we have literally hundreds, tens to hundreds of wires we look at. All right, so you can't see the setup here, but basically the setup, which I apologize for, um, has a light source here, which is a uh, wavelength resolve, uh, an optical train, which ends up with an objective lens to bring the light to focus on your wire systems. We can introduce a polarizing beam splitter, and we can polarize them. We can look at the issue of the angular dependence of polarization. I'll show you results on that and we can study the photoresponse of these wires. And here, again, is, the, uh, is a picture of the basic system. You've got these photodiodes. The white region is where the built-in electric field separates the photo-induced electrons and holes to allow us to measure the voltage across this system and so forth. Um, and we can, of course, control the polarization here. One thing that's really important is 
what in fact are we trying to do here? What's, the, wh what's clever about this, apart from this lateral thing, and I haven't really talked about it, is that we're effectively creating a cavity. So the light, just like I spoke about, that there's a bouncing or a recirculation of light in a photoconductor, nanowire photoconductor, there's also a recirculation, that's of carriers, right, of light in this structure. So we get a gain from the optical system. And it works because we build cavities which have got a high Q. And the expression of that, the Q, just in simple terms, means how many times does the light, does a photon, circulate in our series of wires you know, before it dies off. And the, this is just an expression for an absorption for that uh, Q. But you can see the width, the <laughs> this is terrible, everything's kind of going off. This is um, uh, the intensity, and this axis is the wavelength of light, and this half width defines how good the cavity is. A stronger cavity will, will basically, by interference, create a narrower and narrower um, function here, response function of your, of your system. So we're looking for, for light to live a long time, which means have a very narrow response function. Just to prove that these structures actually work before I give you some results, um, here we're looking at uh, a, what do you call it, SEM image of these things. Actually, we're not, excuse me. Here we're looking at an electron beam induced current image. So you could take, you can excite, there's two ways of exciting. We can either excite with light or we could excite with an electron beam. Both will produce electron hole pairs. So in our case here, we're exciting with an electron beam and we're scanning and synchronously we're measuring the photo response or the, the current response of the device through a null amplifier to ground. And we're doing this at low temperature actually, which I didn't mention. This should be, this is at 77 Kelvin. So what you're looking at here is the contact regions, the central region with the electric field, and the contact again. And you can actually measure effectively the separation of charges here by this image, and, tell, and it's telling us how well this thing's performing. And we can do this under different biases and different excitation con or concentration of carriers and so forth to understand how to engineer these things. So that's one of the techniques we use for feedback apart from the optical response measurements. So what's the basic result? basic result for these wires was that with increasing number of wires you get increasingly strong response first thing which is kind of obvious because the more absorbers you've got the more response you get but more interestingly you notice there's bumps and the first first thought might be well these bumps are noise but they're not noise they're actually fingerprints of the cavity and I'll tell you that in a minute which is the bouncing back and forth of the light to have because of the preferential movement of energy across this thing the other thing is, you can measure the responsivity as a function of theta, which you remember was resolving into the normal and the perpendicular component of the electric field. So from that, we can get all the parameters, if you like, materials parameters in our system, and how they depend on the doping and everything else. So, what am I doing here? There we go. So we wanted to have a good model, so I'm just gonna very briefly say, what we did was we basically implemented a Maxwell solver um, for the structure. Um, the only kind of trick was the perfectly matched layers, the bottom and top of this structure, and how we meshed the wire into the dielectric here. And we solved for different wires, for different plane structures, for different excitation conditions, and so forth. And the, rather than me go through all this in great detail, the main point is we can reproduce these bumps very, very nicely, and show the origin of the bumps, actually, is due to the main origin is this parallel absorption here is giving you the main bumps and the suppressed form is giving you, if you like, a much broader, weaker response. So the cavity, and you can go in and you can look at with and without the cavity and you'll see that basically that it can only be the cavity effects for this basically photonic crystal, one dimensional photonic crystal um, that's giving us the, the very nice response we've got. And the intensity you can match through the suppression factor I mentioned earlier. And this is just the number of wires and the role of that on Q, so you can actually get higher and higher Qs. So you can see we can, you know, in principle engineer, engineer very high Qs, which means sharper peaks, sharper peaks like these to play with. Um, I think I'll leave that alone. So there are a few things you can do. You can change the period, which means the wavelength of the structure, which means the spectral response. You can change the number of, or the wire density effectively, which would be the amplitude of those peaks as well as you can change, in fact, the geometry if you want to kind of change the relative uh, anisotropy in the structure. And this is an example where we 
said we wanted to show that we could actually, by pitch response and so forth, we could enhance blue, green, and red responses tremendously in these structures. Okay, so you can actually now think about, in terms of color matching, you can be anywhere on this CIE chart to design essentially a kind of custom response photodiode, uh, pho sort of camera actually, because you can make these in these arrays in blocks um, with really arbitrary response. The other thing to say, just rather than me go through all these points because I see it's difficult to read, is this line here. You, see, you might say to me, well, this is silicon, so why bother? It's rather like the last little presentation was, this is gallium arsenide, why bother to go two-dimensional like electron gas? They're both gallium arsenide. And in that case, it was the cleverness of the engineering of where the uh, heterostructure put electrons compared to ionized impurities that was giving it. Here, it's the rearrangement of the dielectric response of that medium by how these silicon wires are disposed that take you from up to in this red one with 500 wires, you've got a peak response of four amps per watt. Silicon is down here in these wavelength ranges and you're gonna be at, at 0 0.32, 0 0.33, whatever, amps per watt. So tremendous improvement in the responsivity and also spectrally engineered and polarization engineered. So you can really do kind of interesting things. And that was just kind of some example. All right, so I can see I'm probably doing terribly on time. I have no idea where I am at this point, but anyway, I'll keep going for a bit. So we're still in the physical sensing, and I wanted to kind of give you an example of nanostructure engineering for, again, building, a, if you like, a light sensor, except now in the infrared region. And so it's going to lead to someone's ear, <laughs> as it were, thermal, thermal imaging, um, which has got all sorts of applications. And the objects we're going to look at this time, so we've done sort of, uh, two-dimensional structure, nanostructure, first example. Second example was nanowires. Third one here is going to be quantum dots or nanodots or whatever you want to call these things, right? And again, it's an optical structure. And then the similarity from the last one, so if you kind of remember, was that this is going to be a PIN structure, right? But what we're going to do here is we again want tunability, just like the previous one. We want to be able to resolve um, in regions where normal detection doesn't work so well. So there's plenty of work for things like um, platinum silicon in the kind of near-infrared, and then when we get into the first and second atmospheric windows, mercad telluride or neum antimonide, but they're kind of limited. You can't really tune them. And people in areas such as environmental sensing, people in biology, there's all sorts of applications where people would like to have sensors which can be essentially spectrally engineered. And that's what this is going to be about. All right. So what's the, this, this is work we did with... Um, uh, Lockheed Martin and General Electric uh, in the US and they had expertise um, in templating structures um, and so we kind of did the growth and we did the device work and they were really about building templates that can have sub, uh, sub 10 nanometers uh, basically re resolution of, of objects. Uh, most of what I'll talk about will be around 20 nanometer or so but we looked at all different sizes and the Key point is if you look at this thing here, which is kind of an array of dots, which were done by this uh, technology that they developed, um, was that all the dots here, if you look at them, are very, very close in size. So what we're going to take advantage of in the quantum sense is inter-subband transitions. In a quantum well, you have states, and we want to look at, within, say, the conduction band, we want to look at transitions between those states. So we, uh, we developed this templating approach. <clears throat> you can get quantum dots this size, but it'll be in a broad distribution of size by traditional techniques. And the famous Stransny Krasnikov mode of, of epitaxy will do that, which is that initially you get a wetting layer, and then the wetting layer, the cumulative strain, in case of Indy Marsland or Galley Marsland, the cumulative strain is about 7% lattice mismatch. You build up a, the layer thickness, and it breaks down. Growth breaks down from wetting layer to islanding mode. And with the ionic mode, you get a kind of broad size distribution, which means all the quantum levels are going to be smeared, which means we can't really do a very good inter-subband detector when we have every s little section has got a different spectral response. We lose sensitivity that way. All right. Um, and so the sensor we built, as I said, was a pin structure, uh, P, I, N. And um, 
we built, we looked at different size effects and everything else, and we packaged these things up and made cameras and so forth. But the basic idea, and you can see it here, was, as I said, inter subband transitions. And so you see a fundamental transition, and you see actually a first excited state transition here. And this is um, at, at uh, low temperature, but we actually started to, and I'll tell you when the size gets small enough, uh, and you think about all the phonon issues, you actually can, in very small size objects, keep these things stable to high temperature, and we in fact did. We got them stable to liquid nitrogen with incredibly high uh, sensitivity. And by changing the dimensions, you change the energy le level structure so we can then tune where we want the spectral response. Okay, so here you have, for example, the photocurrent responsivity versus bias, and with bias we can change the gain, right? Because we can essentially uh, control the electric field in the structure and therefore the gain per carrier. And the net result, because I'm not going to keep doing every example in great detail, is that you can, you can achieve incredibly high noise equivalent power, which is what this figure is showing you. Because the difference in temperature between the chap's ear, if you like, the center of their ear and the top, is blooming this sensor we built. Right? So the difference in temperature is actually you know, a few tenths of a degree in this particular kind of thing, not quite, maybe up to about 0.5 of a degree. So incredibly high response. And so you can think about all sorts of applications where you might want to do that. All right, um, I hope, I'm not quite sure with my timing. How much time, how are we doing? 45 minutes. 45, good, all right. So at kick me, at the moment, <laughs> yeah, I know, at the moment, good. Give me a kick at some point when you think I should be winding down, because I think I have more material than I need, <laughs> possibly. All right, um, I want to get into the blue area, because that's kind of a fun one too, which is about radiation sensing. Um, and the particular type of sensors I'm going to be talking about are based on dissimeters. So dissimeter is, so for example, so you go in labs and places and people uh, are doing x-ray testing, radiography, and they kind of get dosed, and they wear badges, which basically they put in and they see how much dose of radiation they've had, and if they had too much, they <laughs> better watch out. So, uh, but dissimetry is used for all sorts of stuff, and we were actually um, asked by kind of the Border Services Agency to see if they could, we could come up with basically sensing arrays for people bringing in radioisotopes into the country. So, sort of an interesting problem. So, anyway, I'll kind of explain how we went about building these dissimeters. And the idea of the dissimeter material is, again, it's very much this idea of particular electronic states and taking advantage of them. So in materials such as carbon doped alumina, which is this thing over here, um, you have this radiation will be absorbed and will create um, effectively trap levels. These are the trap levels here. And the number of traps, the number density of traps, is in proportion to the dose of the radiation. So how, does this, how would such a system work or be useful which is this little kind of pill thing here, is that if I take light, and the light is of energy, uh, which is the difference between this EC level, the conduction band energy, and the trap energy, then I can photoionize. I can take the electron from the trap in the trap center, and I can promote it into a, uh, an extended state, which is where it's shown here with the black arrow. And then that carrier is free to lower its energy into it by being captured by this radiative recombination level here, which, which means a level when it takes, when there's a hole sitting in here and the electron comes there, then I give off the energy of these two here from this stiff from here to there, which will come off as um, much higher energy, light. Right. So I stimulate with low energy light, for example here, this 540 nanometer light, and the emitted light um, is higher energy, which means shorter wavelength. And we call that the optically stimulated luminescence and it's around 420 to 450. Now in order to, and the basic principle is that the um, number density of filled traps, the rate of change of that number density of filled traps, these things here, um, as they change, every time one of these emits, if you like, photoionizes, and we capture its carrier in the recombinations, the light recombining process, we'll end up with light. So that's the probability of photoionization times the number of filled traps with the intensity, right? And there's a little differential equation here, which we can solve, which means that the intensity of the simulated luminescence as a function of time will be exponentially dependent on time, right? With a time constant tau. 
And we can, of course, by recovering the tau for the process, we can use this equation here to calibrate for the uh, sensitive for the for the amount of radiation dose that this sample has seen, the number of traps, if you like, n naught, the initial number of, of traps in the material from uh, exposing it to radiation. All right. So, and sorry, one last point is in order to therefore measure the number of traps or the amount of exposed radiation, this sense of scene, um, we need to better detect photons, individual photons, right? So the problem actually is how to build for this particular wavelength range, which turns out to be where silicon is horrible, how do we build a um, avalanche photodiode, which is a single photon sensor that can be gated in the time scale of this luminescence process to count the photons. And the better we count, the better we can tell the dose. Okay, so that's the problem and what we want to do. Here is an example just to show you of what we mean by this OLC, OSL signature. And you can see uh, that we'd like to recover, we'd like to look at the buildup and the recovery profiles, which you can do. And so how do, what, what is the design that we'd like to get it at? So we want to build an APD, avalanche photodiode, which is again a pin structure, P-I-N. And in this particular case, it's not like the sort of equilibrium structure where there's a high field that I talked about earlier. We're now going to drive, in an APD, you drive this st structure to break down, which means that what you want to do is you have a part of the structure where you're absorbing the light, then you have a part of the structure which defines the built-in field, which means the carriers, once they go through it, are going to ionize, which is literally knock-on ionization, uh, carriers in this material, the punch-through idea, and one carrier electron is going to create many other electrons, so it's called an avalanche process, and we'd like to have this avalanche go until we turn it off. So you have a measurable, one photon will produce a large measurable photocurrent um, so long as we keep this going, but of course we're going into breakdown. So you need to actually stop it at some point, and I'll talk about that. So there are a number of considerations, and I think there's far too much poo on this slide here. So, um, you know, the absorption layer, obviously, just like we talked about with the nanowires earlier, um, you need to, it's about a volume of material, right? So we need the layer thickness. There's a trade-off between the transit time, efficiency, bandwidth, when we deal with layer thickness. In the charge region, which is this region over here, um, we're controlling the electric field, which means controlling point of breakdown, controlling the the avalanching process, if you like, and the punch through. So there's going to be uh, the width of that and the doping are going to be critical concerns for engineering the profile. And then in the avalanche region, this is the piece at the back here, then we've got to, the key aspect will be, of course, we can get this avalanche, but the noise, which means if I'm looking at electrons, I don't want holes to be created at the same time, or really all my gain goes away because I've got a forward, <laughs> I've got one current going this way and one that way, which is nothing. So I want to have a unipolar, one carrier, essentially dictating that. So the relative efficiency of that, the dead space concerns, all of those are important. All right, so I think um, yeah, maybe I should just say a little bit about quenching. So when you break down, you'd say, you know, you've broken down. But the point about these devices is they're reversible. So I can break down into avalanche, but then I'd like to count another photon, which means, of course, it has to be reversible. So the refreshing, which is the key point, right, is, is that you know, the avalanche will continue until quenched. And how do you quench it? By changing the bias. So we pull this thing back up and stop the avalanche process, right? Um, and if you want to now detect another photon, then you have to build up this voltage and this, this field in the circuit and so forth to quench, uh, to, to send it back into that mode. So this is the basic Geiger mode, how you can threshold and how you can discriminate uh, in this device. The, the way we realized it is back to the two-dimensional gas type structures using these PIN structures now where we've got the separate absorption, the separate gain, and the high-doped intrinsic, uh, high-doped region, excuse me, next to the multiplication zone. And size is obviously an issue because we need to get enough signal, right? but we don't want it to be too slow because then you've got a capacitive argument. So there's a balance between the size of the detector, the layer thickness, and everything else. Net result is here's the 
uh, current voltage characteristics for the device. And you can see just in the big scale, here's the forward side, here's the reverse side, which we, we care about, right? And the, the reverse side, basically, on a normal scale, will be flat until breakdown, which is what's happening here. But you notice this breakdown is a gentle breakdown. If you look, you see there is some leakage because the fields are tremendous. If I look on the scale here, I'm looking about 30 volts. When you normally think about these kind of structures, you wouldn't be talking about 30 volts over a few nanometers, right? So th that's the reason why there's leakage. And then, but what we're looking at is this is the real breakdown point over here, right? So essentially, and that's what this piece is over here. If you look at when you, so when you finally go through this thing and you engineer this thing correctly, what you find is if I look at, what you would call state-of-the-art single photon counting schemes, which are used in things like quantum computing and all these things, people try and discriminate and count single photons. In these uh, silicon avalanche photodiodes, you've got a dark count, which means the noise, which is about 15,000. So it's actually completely useless in this wavelength range for trying to discriminate these photons due to these very small number of traps that are induced by the radiation. The other point is that you know you can and you can uh, cool that and you can get better but you're still the ones that we created uh, because of the fact that we changed the composition we changed the size of the radians we went through all that logic i told you about we managed to get down to dark noise which is around 50. And in fact we've actually got some now which are more like 30 uh, counts per second so really you have incredible ability to discriminate uh, photons individual photons with that kind of a sensitivity the other thing is that you know, the spectral response of these centers is important. And you can play around with these layers and you can change the spectral response nicely. You can see it here. We can, we can uh, blue shift, if you like, here, the spectral response um, and, and still get the very high responsivity. And we also get linearity, which you can see here, in terms of how the photocurrent depends on the optical power density or intensity. All right, so... <clears throat> Let me just kind of cut to the chase. So when we finally put this in the system just to demonstrate it, the basic system, we now have kind of much quite different. We started with LEDs. We've now got integrated laser diodes in there and everything else. But the simple system we put in was basically a light source, which could be a triggered light source. As I said, we're now using lasers, obviously. The OSL chip material, the uh, APD down below. And we built this whole thing with Zigbee. So you could basically, you know, very cheap, wirelessly network these things, put them around, because the border services people like that. Um, we've now built these into arrays and kind of done all sorts of other stuff. But basically, lab view VIs to uh, do the count on floating count and everything else. We started by basically building discriminators and fan, fan outs and God knows what, but you don't need it. You can actually do everything nowadays in software, and that was it. So as long as you've got the right key elements, you can really build compact systems, and that was kind of the message of this thing. All right, as long as we're okay, I think I'm going to try another topic. Oh, no, we've got one more thing here. Okay, good. Um, in first the physical, and now this was in the radiation. Um, we're in the green area now. Okay, so what I'm going to do, because I can see that we're going to um, definitely run out of time, I'm just going to give you one example. I have about 10. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry about this. <laughs> Clearly, really good time management here. So I'll just do the one, uh, and then you guys can have a breather from me. Um, looks very sad over there. All right, so the idea is, and this was one particular application, in terms of screening of disease, um, can you come up with sensors for early detection of things like cancer? So uh, we're looking, I'm going to be talking about optical again, optical systems, optical cavities and so forth here. Um, and so the basic idea is that we'd like to have some uh, input, if you like, recognition element, transduction in the sensor, and then an output we can measure. And, you know, for example, the scheme might be we have some binding sites here, antibodies that we, that when the binder is in here, it's going to change the optical response of the system, and we can measure that change in the optical response of this system. So the system I'll talk about here for doing that is going to be based on a photonic crystal. So remember earlier I talked about uh, photonic crystals, one-dimensional photonic crystals for um, those nanowires for the cameras. So now I'm going to be talking about a two-dimensional photonic crystal where we have a, in two directions, this direction and this direction, we have these objects in this lattice array which will trap a mode of light 
And the idea being that the mode of light will bounce around here. Again, the high, di the high Q idea I mentioned before, uh, that the light lasts a very long time in the cavity. So if we can change by binding the properties of this medium, then the light which bounces back and forth is going to change its response. And there's two ways that that can happen. We can, we can either see the adsorbed molecules as changing the effective refractive index in this medium, right? And that would mean that before binding and after binding, we have a change in the spectral response, as you can see here, due to the binding. And the other thing we can think about is optical loss, because we're even though we're going to be talking about a monolayer or so of stuff, which means it's not going to be doing much to absorption, because the Q of the cavity is so high, it's like the monolayer is multiplied by the Q. Right? So if I have a Q of a thousand or a Q of a million, which is the kind of structures we've been building, then I have a million times the effective thickness of that, of that layer, which means I've got very measurable changes. So if I look with a million passes in path length, then of course I'll have this optical loss change, which will damp at the same cavity refractive index, is going to damp down the response. So the combination of the two would give us both a peak shift and a peak damping, which we can use to characterize the analyte that's sitting in this cavity. All right, so this is some examples of what we built. You'd start by, so let me just start, there are, you know, before we did this work, um, people were f basically focused on, they, they saw the advantage of cavities, because uh, it's obvious, but what they were focused on was actually membrane cavities. In fact, nobody was doing anything but membrane cavities. And the membrane, a whole based array, two-dimensional arrays, offered very high cues, as you can see here, but they suffered from a few problems. And one of which, um, one of the most important from a sensing point of view, is you really can't sense very much in these. So if I look at the volume available for analyte and for reaction, if you like, with these bio uh, molecules, it's very small. 16% is void space in this structure. Right? So I can't see very much before I even start. And as you can see, these voids are not interconnected. So basically, it's just going to be compartmentalizing what you look at. The modal volume, which is really important in terms of interaction of a mode with, um, with the molecule, is small too. As you see, it's going to be about half of what we're looking at. So, and the other thing is, of course, it's suspended, which means that you have all the problems of guiding light through a structure which naturally is going to bend. Okay? So what do we look at? We look at structures which were exactly the inverse of this, so kind of not particularly clever, but there it is which are open structures, right? And so here's your waveguide, traditional waveguide, coupling into the cavity the, the, and out on the other side. And you'll see that in, we could, this is the early, this is this paper actually, but in fact we've got, as I said, up to 10 to the 6 now, pretty well 10 to the 6. So um, we can have extremely high cycle times and we can really do it. So what, what, what is it that we did? So the first thing we did was if you think back to the nanostructures I've spoken about to this point, we're always looking at the idea of trying to spatially separate function. So in the APD, the avalanche photodiode, what I showed you was that we separated absorption from multiplication because you have different considerations for both regions. In the two-dimensional electron gas, we separated the region where the carriers were placed, which was in the quantum well structure, from where they were generated so that we could get high mobility, which was distant by a dif difference delta. Even in, I mean, pretty well everything we've looked at, you know, there's been this idea about spatial engineering. No difference here. In this case, we use the logic of traditional quantum wells, which is that you have a core region and around it a cladding region, so that you can essentially have a change in the way the, refractive in the effective refractive index medium is, is organized, and we can get total internal reflection, which would be the equivalent of half-mode guiding by electrons in these structures. So you see the core region is different from the wall region, or the cladding. And we looked at all different regions. We also used a tunable laser. We looked at the temporal response and everything else of these engineered structures. The main point is once you get them right, what you end up with, and this, the narrowness of these peaks, these are the different modal peaks, what you see is very, very narrow spectral uh, peaks, 
which correspond to exactly the modes being tightly confined or very, very high Q. Right? The higher the Q, remember I showed you that before, the delta lambda upon lambda becomes smaller and smaller, right? because the energy lasts longer in the cavity, and it basically self-selects into a center mode. Um, and here you can see the kind of fit to the modal intensity, which is extremely narrow. You can see around a, a uh, particular wave. And this is, just look at the scale. So you can see we're dealing with point, you know, point oh five, point 0.5 here, um, nanometers on this 15 nanometer, 40, well, very small, right? And the point oh 0.05 on that. So the first thing is how, you know, the engineering, right? Because just like in any nanostructure, by playing with periods and whatever, you can engineer its response. And here, um, we're looking at the change in response by changing the, uh, the periods here, the diameters of these rods and so forth, right? So you can see here, this is telling you the equivalent response. If we think about the size of a typical protein here, um, it can change by two-tenths of a nanometer. So we can obviously should be able to see, even with these early structures, we should be able to see individual molecules. And just to show you an extreme case of refractive index change, which is basically what that was about, um, effective refractive index by the, by the mode width, um, what you see here is if we have the dry structure that I kind of showed you earlier in theory, and we now put DI water in it, the same spectral response is shifted right, by 120 nanometers by the presence of water, a nice polar medium, right? So incredible response in terms of refractive index units, right? And you can plot that out here. So here you're looking at taking different calibrated refractive index liquids, putting them in this structure, and seeing the peak shift, right? Very, very strong peak shift, nice peak shift. Very predictable, you can go back to um, uh, doing comm cell simulations, <coughs> FTDD, finite difference time domain calculations, you can actually calculate what you expect and you'll get the same basic response, which is something like three and a half nanometers for a 0.01 change in refractive index sort of thing. So very, very strong, three, 10 minus four in this particular case change. So you can therefore use these things to make really nice biosensors. All right, I think I'm gonna stop here because that's the next one. And I think we have enough, enough material for you guys. We're about, we're about out of time, right? Let me, let me just go to my final, there's tons of stuff here, which would be way too much for you to look at. Yes, so let me go to the last one, okay? <laughs> the, the last slide, so you can have a break from my tedious voice. Um, so, we discussed a spectrum, haha, of sensor technologies for physical, biochemical, and radiological sensing. I just gave you one example in this case. <coughs> and the thing I wanted to, want you to take home is the message is trying to emphasize how important the design of these nanostructures are in order to uh, get these sort of enhanced properties that you can use to make really interesting sensors. And these sort of sensors can be put together uh, within, you know, and I kind of mentioned that to some degree with the radiation sensing. You can, with the IoT kind of platforms and wireless uh, connectivity and so forth, you can start to put these things together to, to make intelligent sensing systems where you have a fusion of information from these three things, for example, together to give you really intel make intelligent decisions on something. And so, as I said, the, the platforms that I discussed in the physical included imaging platforms, which would be these two in the infrared and the visible, I talked about motion sensing, be it acceleration, position, or whatever, or vibrations. Um, and I spoke about the, uh, the Geiger mode APD used for uh, effectively ultra-low dose sensing of radiation, and spoke about this one in particular here, um, this photonic crystal biosensor as a means for ultra-low concentrations of biomolecules and actually doing specificity, uh, which I didn't really talk about, which you can do, of course, by tuning time scales, tuning wavelengths, excitations, and so forth. And you can imagine you can do spectroscopy, you can do ultra high resolution uh, because of the response of these, these structures. Okay, that was it. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> and I'd be happy to answer some questions, but maybe I should get this uh, special hearing aid so I can understand. Okay, so I'm now plugged in.
Vocals. What? <laughs> Fresh and smooth. Right. Uh, they're all sleeping. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I am too. I mean, I try to stay awake, but already. yeah, it's night. <laughs> and this was part part one. <laughs> yeah. Уважаемый профессор, вы нам изложили целый ряд очень интересных идей. А есть ли, так сказать, одна, две, три идеи, которые доведены уже, скажем, до уровня образцов таких разработок конкретных? Это все внедрено. Uh, yes, so I think I, I think I understood the question. The question it was, uh, are any of these technologies currently implemented? Is, is that correct? Yeah, the answer is yes. So actually, the uh, Quantigot infrared imager is being used by Lockheed Martin right now. Um, that's actually a technology which they're using in many of their systems. Um, the balanced photodiode, well, let me just think what else. Um, yeah, sure, so that's, that's Lockheed Martin and General Electric. The other, where's my pointer? <laughs> Point over here. All right, the um, TD Gas Center. Uh, so there's a company uh, in Texas that is doing oil and gas exploration. And they have actually implemented these, excuse me, these sensing systems of ours um, for discovery. And, and the way they work it is because we can make these incredibly small and light and we can spectrally discriminate vibrations. What they do is they take a helicopter <laughs> and they drop <laughs> thousands of these things out the window. And at the same time, they set off a, an explosive in the ground to launch S&P waves in the ground. And they look at the back reflected sound, which, they, which these are wirelessly coupled together, which give them the far field uh, picture of of what's happening down there. And from that, they can map with that data coming back. In one experiment, they can map the topography beneath the ground of whether it's because of the density, right? Density difference when you launch these waves, they can, they can sense the topography and the density of the material beneath uh, and say, you know, it's oil, it's whatever it is, and where it is or, or whatever. So that's, they've been using those from us. And we have, a, we have a patents on that and so forth. Um, as far as the um, other stuff, this actually, uh, this radiation sensor was developed in conjunction with a bunch of hospitals actually. They came to us um, and these are implemented as well. Um, it was originally a project which was actually the Border Securities Agency um, and they are using them but I, they, they're very quiet. <laughs> they haven't told me what they're doing but they, they funded this work originally. And we got permission that we could let them implement a version of this for people in hospitals so that they could actually monitor the people who are administering radiation to patients. So those, those two are in place. The others, um, this thing is a work in progress and eventually I'm pretty sure we're gonna have devices and systems on those lab on a chip effect effectively using that technology, but not yet. Thank you. <coughs> Questions? Yes. Oh, that sounds good in English. How your system works in concept? Can you give us a simple example? Yes. So, I mean, the basic. Uh, that's a good. That's a good point. Um, so basically. At this point, we're actually working, and <laughs> I actually, for once, I, I hate to do this, but actually we are under a non-disclosure agreement with a, a company. Um, so I've, I can't actually tell you exactly, but let me give you print the principle, which is kind of what I said on the slide. So the basic principle is that we, uh, that for whatever we want to look at, the analyte, we want to look at, let's call it an analyte, we uh, basically functionalize the surface of these pillars and it's specific to a particular thing um, and that's how it adheres. 
we are also working, so that's, that's one route to sensing. The other route to sensing, and that's something we're doing with the people with cancer, so I'm going to just kind of give you generic, is that we spectroscopically uh, use certain uh, responses. Um, of, and I, that's about all I can say. And the fact is they're enhanced by particular ways that light travels around these cavities. So what I didn't tell you about is that if I look at the optical band structure of this cavity, there are X modes in K-space and there are actually uh, C modes. The X modes are very interesting because they have um, incredibly high spatial response where they put the mode in terms of where the dielectric is and the guiding path. So we can actually use that to discriminate and we use a two scheme discrimination because of the optical, because the sensitivity of the path light takes and its wavelength dependence. And that's very useful in this case. So that's about as close as I can get to answer your specific question, which was cancer, uh, because it's actually a little bit outside the realm. But, it's, but it, I think I've given you enough that you might be able to imagine how you might go from here to there without me actually killing myself, <laughs> if that's OK. <laughs> okay yeah, thank you. stay alive, right? OK. <laughs> questions? That guy, I'm sure, Which guy? to ask uh, oh, his why questions. don't you use um, yeah. giant magnetic uh, G GMR? Oh, oh, I see, giant magnetic impedance for what? Yeah, yeah. I for could. measuring uh, magnetic field. Because oh, yeah, absolutely, whole, absolutely. Whole system, yes, yeah? yes. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it's an alternative way of doing it. Um, the idea, I mean, to be honest with you, um, we took that platform because it's very good, but what's nice about it is that we can spectrally resolve. So we can have independent elements, and we looked at a spectral range from uh, tens of hertz to um, microhertz, um, and we can resolve that really in basically each, each bandwidth uh, in 10 units, so, and with very, very high response. So with GMR, you'd have a problem actually effectively. I guess you, I can imagine a way of doing it. So yes, that's an alternative way of doing it but it's much easier in this way because you really can have isolation essentially between those sensors, which is something that would be difficult on, that, on a magnet, purely magnetic platform. Yeah. Okay, no yeah. questions. Let's thank speaker. Again. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.